As I'm sure you know, I interact with a lot of older people. Whether it be the friars in my own community, priests in the diocese, or just parishioners, I spent a lot of time in the last few years with people whose religious imagination was formed in the 1960s and 70s. In some ways, it's just the state of our church today. Among this group of people, there is a common line that I hear a lot, a sentiment that seems to resound with so many I see. They say, these seminarians these days, they're so conservative and rigid, all they care about is the liturgy. In one way or another, I've heard hundreds of people express some form of disappointment in successive generations. It happens all the time. They look with worry at a religious or priest under 40. I, with suspicion, any of us who wear religious garb, have traditional sensibilities for the liturgy, refer to canon law or the pre-1960s church, or act in formalized ways with titles and positions. What's even more interesting, I guess you could say, is seeing religious orders and dioceses bemoaning the fact that new members are changing the spirituality of their community, or worse yet, dying out because they can't find young people who think and act like them. Even within the same community, there is resistance to vocations because the new ones are not like us. And look, don't get me wrong, I'm speaking here in huge generalities. The problem may not be because of these specific issues, and it's certainly not universal to every community. I recognize that those who really are complaining are experiencing serious loss. The life that they joined is fading away, in a sense. I don't mean to paint too broad a stroke or to minimize the complexity of the situation. What I simply mean to point out, and what I want to address in this video, is the fact that there are many in the church that are experiencing generational problems. People formed in one era are realizing that people in other eras don't share their same sensibilities or values, and this is causing problems. They feel like something they love is being taken away from them, and they want to hold on to it. To which, I simply ask this question. Isn't that precisely what happens when they joined 40 or 50 years ago? If we were to go back to the 1960s and 70s, when many of our elders were first starting to claim the faith as their own, what we would no doubt see is a generation of their elders bemoaning their very existence. Formed in the 20s and 30s, these men and women would have been brought up in a completely different church than what they were witnessing. Right before their eyes would have been a generation of people completely upending everything they had ever known. Discarding distinctive religious garb, celebrating extremely casual liturgies, engaging in familial relationships with the laity. You know the story. The 1960s and 70s would have been a complete culture shock to many in the generations before it. Now, looking back with the privilege of hindsight, we can certainly argue the merits of these changes, just as we can argue the merits of the changes we're seeing today. But that's really not the point. Don't get bogged down in stuff like, the 1960s ruined the church. The point is that a generation looked around at the world, read the signs of the times, and brought to the church a spirituality and lifestyle that they thought would best respond to its needs. The point is that they were given the freedom to do so. Regardless of what their predecessors thought, they were given the opportunity to make the church their own. This is what successful communities do. This is what the church has always done. Communities that last through the ages do not remain rigidly attached to the particularities of a single culture or generation, but continue to refound themselves when necessary. What made the church successful in 1930 was not necessarily what the world needed in 1970, and so adaptations were made. And again, we can debate the merits of those changes. That's not the focus right now. But I do want to make it clear that I don't think that everything that happened in that time period was a waste. I think that the shift towards the casual and the familiar, the emphasis on peace and justice, the personalization of the faith, these things were exactly what people were yearning for, and so I believe that my predecessors acted earnestly and with great vigor for the kingdom. Which is why, frankly, I find it a bit frustrating that they don't recognize the same thing happening again today. Just as they were given the freedom to respond to their circumstances, to bring their spirituality, to adapt the church to a new generation, they should give the same freedom to this generation. While wearing jeans and a t-shirt to interact with college students in the 1970s may have been just what college students needed at the time, a chance to break down artificial separations and have meaningful, collegial relationships with priests and religious, it may not be what they need now. Today, an entire generation of people don't know what a priest looks like. 
have never seen a habit before. They yearn for public symbols of faith. For us, wearing religious garb isn't a sign of clericalism, it's a sign of evangelization, of radical commitment in a secular world. The times have changed, and so too must our approach. Having casual and improvised liturgies with minimal vestments in familiar places may have been just what people needed 40 years ago, an opportunity for the first time to encounter the imminent nature of God and community, to be able to sacramentalize the ordinary world. But that's not necessarily what people are looking for today. In a world of ever-changing chaos, where nothing is sacred and God is absent, there's something about the formal nature of liturgy, saying the same words that others are saying around the world, taking part in something different and outside of oneself, is wildly appealing. For me, following the rubrics of Mass is not an act of rigidity, it's an act of humility, of obedience. The liturgy can be both joyful and ordered at the same time. We can go on and on down this road, and that's great. But again, I don't want to get caught in the weeds here. My point is not to get stuck on these specific opinions of what the church does or does not need, but to come back to the same point I've been getting at throughout this video. As the world changes, as the needs of the church change, so too must our approach. I'm not talking about specific teachings or dogmas of the church. The faith remains the same throughout the ages. I'm talking about the lived experience of faith, the generational shifts that have come in and out for centuries. The songs we sing, the clothes we wear, the devotions we keep. These things come and go, and we must resist the urge to attach ourselves to a particular expression. Just because something worked in a particular time doesn't mean that it is something that we should continue today. That's also not to say that every new innovation or renewal is necessarily a positive one. Just as I push back against those who cling to the 1960s, I resist the young, zealous religious who enters the order to fix it, who looks to previous generations with disdain. Previous generations may have made some mistakes, yes, but let's give them the benefit of having lived this life many more years than we have, okay? For me, if this thing called religious life is going to continue, really, if our church is going to thrive, it's going to need to balance the wisdom of experience that wants things to stay the same with the hope and fervor of youth that wants things to be renewed. The two have important roles to play. The more that they are at odds with one another, the more likely we are going to become a reactionary people, swinging the pendulum back and forth, making the same mistakes as those before us. Because really, when it comes down to it, if our utmost goal is to live the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a meaningful way that others are inspired to come to Christ themselves, then I think the question for us all, new and old, is the same. What does it mean to be a disciple today? Not a disciple in 1930, not in 1970, today. Answering this question may mean that older generations have to let go of what is familiar for something different. It might mean that newer generations have to accept some of the things from before as valid and let go of our own convictions. I don't know. What I do know is that it absolutely means having the humility to look at our own motives, our own desires, our own sensibilities, and ask if they truly benefit the church or if they're just comfortable to us. That is a tough question. And honestly, there's not going to be a clear answer in every case. Which, when you think about it, is kind of the beauty of the matter, isn't it? Our church is not some monolithic organization with a single way of thinking or acting or worshiping. We are the universal church, a place where young and old can coexist, where the traditions of the past can stand next to ones newly formed. When it comes down to it, being Catholic means that my spirituality and your spirituality need not be in competition. In fact, they might just both benefit the church and each other. Listen to one another, learn from one another, and we might just find that we're all closer to the kingdom of God.